BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And just a quick reminder every Monday is Zodiac Mondays. Wednesday is an Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA, so please drop your questions below for things that you would like discussed here on the show. And Friday is an Anything Goes. Any subject is fair game, mostly talking about true crime, serial killers, the Zodiac Killer, but any subject is welcome. All right, so please share some ideas in the comment section about what you would like to hear about on this channel, and let's get started. Okay, hello everybody. It is Thursday, and I would like to drop the quick announcement that we will be doing the regularly scheduled episode on Friday of this week. So this is sort of a bonus episode, and in fact it is a reiteration of one that was done back in 2018. What happened was I got on YouTube because I was looking for a particular episode called American Vandal, True Crime and Ethical Journalism, and that is done by the channel Sarah Z, that's the YouTube name, and in the search results I happened to come across an episode from none other than Black Box Online Radio, the Ethics of True Crime Black Box Vlog, and that was one that was done in the spring of 2018. It's hard to believe that this channel was going on that long, and um... That one had a few imperfections in it, as well as some uh, some things were going on in the background. So I wanted to, um, as, I, as we said, do this as sort of a reiteration, repackaging, and revamping of the subject. The ethics of true crime, what a subject. This is one that we encounter a lot on the channel because we're talking about people who have been murdered, we're talking about people who've experienced very intense tragedies, people who've experienced serious emotional loss, and there are so many problems that this genre has encountered, and over the past three years, as we said, going back to uh, 2018 and even back to 2017, really, when this channel started, I've definitely had my share of mistakes in the true crime world, because when you're talking about people who've experienced real tragedies, how really do you deal with the subject? And first, I would like to begin with something that I um, heard not on a true crime channel, but on the channel SBSK, Special Books by Special Kids, which is run by an individual named Chris, and he was interviewing someone named Daniel. And Daniel was dealing with schizoaffective disorder, and that was the subject material for the episodes. They're called Living with Schizoaffective Disorder and Visiting My Schizoaffective Friend After His Forced Psychiatric Stay on SBSK. And um, they were asking him the question about coming forward on a YouTube channel and not only having somebody talk about his experiences, meaning the host, but also going on that channel and sharing his stories and, and broadcasting them out to the world. Like, where are the ethical boundaries with this? Or is there any possibility that somebody's story could be exploited for someone else's personal gain? Is there any possibility that ex exploitation could exist, period? And this individual, Daniel, who had been through some major hardships in his life, both physical and mental, once again, it was about schizoaffective disorder, he said, you do the best you can, you try the best you can. And I think that's a very good way of approaching the truth crime subject, because yes, indeed, if it is true crime, you're going to be dealing with real stories of people who have experienced um, a lot of very, very intense tragedies. Like, I was listening to this one podcast that was telling a story, and they're trying to do it in an entertaining way, but it was when a woman was attacked by her ex-boyfriend, and he destroyed her car, and her eye was swollen shut from him beating her, and she was cut across the neck, and she survived. But I was thinking that this, no matter who she is, that is probably in the top five worst experiences of her life. And they, the podcast was done in a very good way. It was very engaging, informative, they were citing sources, and... I have to admit as well, it was very entertaining. And then I even felt kind of weird listening to that because, yes, it's um, a show that's trying to highlight the outrageousness of the true crime world, and that one did uh, meet all the, all the objectives. But at the same time, I was like, 
what on earth really am I doing listening to something like that purely for my entertainment? When it comes to true crime, I think the motivations for people to tune in to this type of material is really uh, threefold. Firstly, uh, some people genuinely have curiosity about the darker side of humanity, and we try to avoid a certain sense of censorship. I mean, a certain type of censorship, I should say. We don't want to make any tongue twisters. And that means that if we're going to learn about how humans function, we have to learn everything. Not only the warm and fuzzy parts, not only the stories of courage and uplifting spirit, but what about the stories of destruction? What about the dangerous side of humanity that we all know is there? But how do we uh, confront that subject? And furthermore, what is hiding in the shadows, more or less? And I think a lot of people are drawn to that. And the second thing that um, um, I really do have to uh, quote the Stones Unturned for saying that the true crime genre is 40% horror story, 40% sob story, and then 20% facts, meaning that it fuels morbid curiosity and it also fuels human empathy, and then you're actually discussing the source material. But um, the human empathy part is very important because it shares so many things about what people are really experiencing, what people are actually going through. And I think if you didn't have the human empathy, like the human empathetic element, it would be somewhat immoral. Like if you were just to say, hey, this person was murdered and this happened to their body and then they were discarded at this location. If you didn't get that type of connection to the individual as a human being, then... Um, I don't think there would be any true crime genre at all. So we can see that, um, as we said, the stuff about lurking in the shadows, that is more about the morbid curiosity, but I often like to use the term miserable curiosity, meaning something that would make the average person feel miserable, but at the same time you just have this um, giant desire and passion and yearning to know about it. Because, as we said, you have to learn everything. And if people are going to talk about fighting censorship and how censorship is bad, well, we don't want to censor those types of ideas. And the next thing that um, people often look to with the true crime world is security. Another video that came up um, under Sarah Z's um, channel with the search results was called Ethics of True Crime by Annalise Russell. And throughout that video, she shares um, her opinions as well as asking two big questions. Number one, why are so many women involved with the true crime world? And I know this sounds kind of crazy, but I was surprised to see that, you know, I'd be watching a true crime video on YouTube or downloading a true crime podcast from a different site. And when I would look through the comment section, almost all of the names would be women on some channels, right? Right. And I'm, um, of course, on other channels. I mean, sometimes the audience is predominantly male. But I, for the first time, I was surprised about that. But it's something that we do think about from time to time. And in this regard, um, I think that I can answer this question. Firstly, I once read an article from the New York Times that talked about how true crime reinforces the principles of security in society. And that is why women are um, attracted to this genre, as well as men, too. I mean, I that, that that could even be one of the reasons why I like true crime or why I try to learn about these things. And the second one is that on the podcast, The First Degree, that I've talked about a lot here on Black Box Online Radio, one of the co-hosts made the statement that learning about true crime cases tells you what you need to do to feel safe in the world. Now, in regards to the ethics of true crime, um, Annalise Russell asked a second question, which I cannot answer. And if anybody has anything they would like to share in the comment section, if anybody would like to weigh in and share their opinions and say what they want to, um, what they believe and what they feel, I would love to read your comments down below, so please feel free to do so. But she said, how would you feel if you were murdered in some way, somehow, you're watching Earth from, like, the great beyond, and the host of a show is talking about your murder and says, Oh my gosh, I have this crazy story for you. Oh my gosh, I have this great thing to tell you. And they start talking about your murder. Now, of course, I can't answer that. I don't actually know what that type of experience would be like. That's an out-of-this-world, out-of-body, out-of-the-earth experience. Uh, but... um. 
I think going down that pathway, um, I would firstly just be kind of impressed that someone is talking about me at all. I think that I would also feel um, somewhat bad in the long run, but do you see what she's doing? That's not really a question that is meant to be given a super precise answer. It's just that I don't even, I don't like to shy away from challenge questions like that. So if anybody wants to weigh in in the comment section below, I would love to read your responses. What I can tell you for certain is I would probably feel really bad if they were talking about one of my family members in that way, just as a crazy outrageous story that um, is meant to fuel um, someone else's desire for entertainment in a very uh, mocking and insulting way. Because let's not kid ourselves, I mean, people often tune into the true crime world for entertainment. I, um, I view it as a few different things, like entertainment, education, commentary. I think true crime is a place in which all of those things can come together. And as Daniel said, you do the best you can by trying to maintain a standard of integrity. Now, in regards to um, one presentation tactic in the true crime world, I don't know how popular these things are now, but for a long time, people were really caught up with true crime and comedy, and they were trying to blend together these elements of true crime with humor. They're like making fun of the odd aspects of the situation, and there's lots of giggling and laughing. I'm uh, definitely not a fan of those things. I remember the first time I ever heard BuzzFeed's true crime a video series here on YouTube. I should just say the BuzzFeed True Crime channel. I was so disappointed, and they're just like mocking, you know, someone who has died or a missing person's case, and I don't watch any of those things anymore. I really do try to avoid it, but as we said, since 2018, I've done some things on this channel that have turned out to be unethical. In uh, January of last year, it's now January of this year, I don't know why these things come to mind in the winter time, but I did an episode on the channel called Zodiac Killer Harvey Hines Theory, in which I was ap apologizing to um, Harvey Hines for always getting his name wrong. He was one of the investigators in the Zodiac case, more like um, someone who was a theorist rather than an investigator. He's the person who introduced Lawrence Kane as a Zodiac Killer suspect, but many times on the channel I'd refer to him as Harvey Hopkins. I was actually thinking of Harry Hopkins. It must have been. It must have been, but, um, so I just did a quick apology for that, and then I just started talking in some silly voices and saying stuff like, lightning roll, like, I'm um, like, I was talking in a very silly way, and then I was like, what am I doing? Why did I do that? Like, um, I mean, I was trying to poke fun at some people who had made some comments about Black Box Online Radio in a negative way, and, um, you know, trying to, uh, share some things. And Alex Jones was also a very negative influence on me because someone uh, once called into Alex Jones's show on InfoWars, which I don't listen to anymore, but I did back in 2017. And um, what they uh, said was they were making some negative comments about his speaking voice. And he simply said, well, would you prefer if I do this voice? So like I did the whole the whole episode, like 15 minutes of it out of a 17-minute episode in silly voices and such, and I was like, what am I doing? Why did I do that? And I had to take it down, and I did re-record re that one as well. It's a thing called Zodiac Killer Harvey Hines Theory re-upload, because um, I, for the longest time, I've been critical of people like that, and then I turned around and did it myself, and I mean, when you're um, putting stuff out very frequently, not everything is going to be done in the exact same way, but it, it's hard. It's really hard to find that exact balance about dealing with sensitive material, because even the Zodiac Killer mystery, real people were murdered. Real people lost their lives. The victims' families never got any closure or any justice, and, I mean, even just the people who are listening to that stuff on YouTube, I mean, and you're just, like, making a mockery of someone else's murder for, um, I mean, like, just to show off, which is what I was doing, and I was wrong. But so, um, I think that that is something that uh, we always need to bear in mind in the true crime world. And, uh, like, yesterday on the channel, we did our AMA, which you can find here on Black Box Online Radio. And that one was, um, a little bit different, because there's a segment in there that's just talking about trying legalized ecstasy, which is called Katie. And, um, I mean, I think that that can be approached in a different way, because 
I mean, I dedicated a segment just to that material, and I was really trying not to be silly during the true crime parts or even during the UFO story parts. You can be a little bit more, um, you can be a little bit sillier when you're talking about UFOs because those don't necessarily mean that somebody was murdered, if you can catch my drift. But, um, so I really want to try and separate any type of silliness or even just poking fun at the outrageousness of a subject for um, the entertainment value and instead focus on um, focus on the actual events that had took place in the in the murder case. And somebody even left a comment on yesterday's upload that um, once I was doing that legalized ecstasy stuff that um, it was the first time that they heard me talk in a way that wasn't calm and a way that wasn't serious. Oh yeah, that was um, Zio FIFA who says, I listen to almost every video you upload and it is honestly funny to hear you sound so drugged up or weird. It sounds so hilarious because most of the time you sound calm and serious. Ha, huh? thank you Zio FIFA for listening and um, everybody um, who has uh, listened to the channel as well. I really appreciate all of your support. Now, when I was doing that episode back in 2018, I was talking about an example of something that was kind of pushing the ethical boundaries of true crime as well, and it was the death of Jonathan Cruz from Texas, which was still an ongoing discussion at the time, and I had a lot of theories about that particular instance. The death of Jonathan Cruz was one where people couldn't determine whether or not he committed suicide or it was an accidental death or he was murdered by his uh, girlfriend at the time, Brenda Lazaro. The evidence was um, very perplexing at the time. And I had recorded an episode about that twice in 2017, and I was like, I just can't upload it. Yes, it's theoretical, and yes, I was saying what I believed really happened, but, I mean, I knew that there was a high chance that I was wrong. That, um, in fact, in that instance, I had believed that the, um, the ex-girlfriend, his girlfriend at the time, who was present when he died, was innocent, and I'm like, wow, if anybody who has any first-hand connection to him were to ever listen to this, I was like, they would probably really not want to hear that, and I also thought that no one is really going to keep, take this point of view seriously, as well as just the fact that I'm saying what I think happened in this possible murder case even though I have no certainty of it, it's just, um, you know, like following along with YouTube videos and looking at the course of events and you're trying to say, okay, now if this event happened, then this event should have happened alongside it. That's what I was trying to do. And I had recorded it twice in 2017 and I just couldn't bring myself to upload it because um, I knew that I was just talking out of my ass more or less about uh, someone's personal tragedy. But um, I eventually did record it in 2018. I put it up and then I just took it down. And then I re-uploaded one in 2019. And um, somebody even wrote into the channel talking about that. And you can hear the stuff, the death of Jonathan Cruz here on Black Box Online Radio. And they said, your theory is wrong. I mean, like, that's not what happened. And I'm just like, yes, I was wrong. I should never have put that stuff out there. I was just going down sort of a twisted rabbit hole of the thing where you get tunnel vision and you just keep re-examining the same thing over and over again and then you become blind to everything else that is around you. From time to time on this channel I quote the neuroscientist Crystal Dilworth who made um, a very insightful st statement about how the brain functions saying that the human brain functions like a spotlight. If you can just ma imagine like a circular um, cone of light and like if you can you can see everything within the light but in the dark areas like at the limits of where the spotlight can go, the brain has to guess. And it just is like, well, you don't know what's in the dark. You have to guess and you just have to, um, you don't really know what you're going to be experiencing. And if you don't ever get curious about what's in that dark area, then you're just going to be left with thinking the same thing over and over again. And that's going to lead to its own host of, uh, destructive issues. And, um, no, I mean, I really shouldn't have been, um, kind of just putting out things that were insensitive to say about someone's death or trying to um, praise somebody whom I believed was innocent. And in fact, now I've had a major reversal about that type of material. And the only other thing I would say about uh, subjects that um, I haven't really talked about were um, the things with 9-11 Truth. I recorded one episode about 9-11 Truth for Black Box Online Radio, and then I was like, I just can't put this out there. I mean, 
for the same reasons. It's done in an ins insensitive way. It's saying things that a lot of people would not want to hear, but it's not done in a way in which it, um, it invigorates the debate or it invigorates curiosity. Instead, it's more just like telling people off, and I was like, this is um not appropriate for me to upload. So um I've uh I've made a lot of mistakes on the channel in terms of um presentation tactics as well as um also I guess the biggest one that we mentioned in that previous episode back in 2018 and that was about um there was a missing persons case from Canada involving an individual named Emmanuel Boachi, and I have also told this story before many times on the channel, but just to say it one more time because this is a reiteration upload. And he disappeared in 2018, and I was a big fan of the Lord and Arts channel, which is hosted by John Lorden, and I was uh, watching his show Brain Scratch Searchlight, which comes out on Wednesdays, and he was talking about the disappearance of Emmanuel Boachi, so I composed a response to that episode, also by reading, you know, one or two articles, and I had watched that video as the source material, and I said, here's what I think happened. And somebody wrote into the comments section saying that um, they were a family friend, that he had already been found dead, they viewed my comments as very insensitive, I'm just making assumptions about him, I didn't know what was going on, and I shouldn't have been saying that, and... I was so conflicted at the time because I was like, I wanted to feel something for the person, like, I, I, but at the same time, I didn't know if she was telling the truth or not, and I was, and in that episode that I did back in 2018, you can even hear, it's like, well, there's nothing posted on the internet, I mean, and that's at the time, though, someone who did write in was telling the truth. It's just, as a family friend, she learned the news before the internet did, and everything she said was correct. And um, even other people were calling her out in the comments section saying, what are you talking about? How can you say these things? But, um, you know, like she did uh, share that with me, and then as soon as I learned that the, um, that the story was true, I took that video down, and then I decided I'm not really going to talk about missing persons cases or... Um, talk about instances that do not really, um, I guess you would say that things that are not super um, well covered, I mean like I will talk about the well covered cases like the disappearance of Madeline McCann or the disappearance of Maura Murray because those things already have so many other pieces of material out there. Back in 2018 and 2019, we were also mentioning many things about O.J. Simpson, looking at the alternative theories, and there was a very big O.J. truther movement. I mean, maybe it's still going out there, and I have to say that I think that William C. Deere, Bill Deere, who wrote the book, O.J. is Guilty But Not of Murder, repackaged as O.J. is Innocent and I Can Prove It, was someone who was one of the largest proponents of that, and if you do get a chance to watch a six-part miniseries that was done on that, you can see how his alternative theory is actually broken down, and it's almost incorrect that O.J. Simpson was innocent, or what William Deere thought about the case was incorrect. But we were looking at all the different theories in the O.J. Simpson case, the alternative theories. Do I um, really have to uh, think too much about putting out a video about O.J. Simpson? I would say that Black Box Online Radio is the least of the Juice's worries. Um, I also think that some people like Gerald and Kate McCann, the parents of Madeline McCann, are probably not going to think twice about what's on Black Box Online Radio because those instances are so widely covered. Even if you are saying something very theoretical out there on, the, on YouTube, like on the channels and such, then you can share ideas a little bit more easily when it's something that has received a very small amount of coverage, and it's still an ongoing development, just what we said about that uh, missing persons case from 2018, then those are instances in which um, the family has a much larger impact, or they are impacted by my words, by other people's words, much more easily, and it creates a more devastating effect. So I think that we can use our human sense of judgment and um, look at things sort of on a case-by-case -case basis, but also recognize the differences in the situation. Because as that guy Daniel said at the beginning, you do the best you can, you try the best you can. And as human beings, we do need to learn about things. And we do need to explore things that are in the dark, like 
go outside of, the, of that cone of light and not only rethink the same thing over and over again, but also listen to uh, different points of view. So I think that that is going to be wrapping up the um, re the um, discussion that I wanted to, I wanted to say about the ethics of true crime and everything related. If you have anything to say at all, please drop your ideas in the comments section below. And this was, was just a bonus upload, just revamping something that had been done in the past. We will be continuing tomorrow with our Anything Goes segment on Friday. And also, if there's anything that you would like to hear about on the channel, please drop something in the comments section below. And I would invite you to check out our episode, Zodiac Killer Harvey Hines Theory Re-Upload, to uh, pick up where this one has been leaving off and just to... um learn more about anything related to that. Okay, that's all for me now. See you on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.